If there's one question that's been plaguing anyone who's been suffering from the long-term effects of the most recent and unpleasant coronavirus, it's what the hell is going on? In my last film, I tried to answer that with the help of Miller, Wenzel and Richard's NAD plus deficiency theory. Well, here I hope to get to the bottom of it uh, by talking to Dr. Wenzel himself. If you haven't already seen the previous film, I recommend you have a watch of that first, as the biochemistry gets kind of complicated. If I can work out how to do it, I'll put a link up here somewhere. If you already have, or simply can't be bothered, here's a recap from Nikita Alexandrov, who wrote the article that covered uh, the original hypothesis in the first place and gathered all the attention. So COVID seems to... Uh attack some critical enzymes coupled to the NAD plus system, CERT1 and PARP. So you have this kind of depleted NAD plus, you have a leaky gas tank, and your body makes up for that by basically activating alternative pathways to produce it and uh, feeding tryptophan in, which is very inefficient and produces neurotoxins like quinoleic acid. The direct effects are tissues aren't supported bioenergetically, so metabolically um, intensive tissues like your brain, your heart, your liver, your gut, etc. are having these um, bioenergetic issues. That's why you seem to see damage in all these areas without direct viral presence. Um, the side effects are as tryptophan's fed in, it's depleted and this depletes your circulatory serotonin, which is a bit different than the serotonin pool in your brain. It does affect your brain uh, glucose, which causes probably some of the brain fog, but the circulatory serotonin is a bit of a master modulator, and um, that's made up for by your body triggering mast cell activation to release serotonin locally. So there, there's these kind of direct and indirect effects and all of them cascading and uh, working in the long term. And therein you have the ream of symptoms associated with mast cell activation syndrome, which pretty much filled the rest of your long COVID bingo book, uh, including the mimicking of POTS and dysautonomia. Along with this theory comes good news though, it's treatable. Nicotinic acid, or niacin, can help replenish your source of NAD+. And there's a stack of other supplements which help deal with the rogue metabolic pathways too. So, with all of that sorted, let's dive into the chat. I asked Dr. Wenzel if he was optimistic about the chances of recovery for long haulers. Am I optimistic? I'm very optimistic. I think we're going to be looking at uh, the science that COVID has brought us, the ability to look into COVID is going to give you a lot of answers to a lot of other things. So from a COVID perspective, yes, um, I'm now, I think from the 24th of Feb to what, December, I'm out of it. I'm, I'm back on, on my windsurfing board sailing three hours a day. So has it taken a long time? Exceptionally, I don't think it's easy. Um, it's not a, this is not a magic, um, a, a magic pill that you're going to give someone in three days later. So which parts take a, a long time, going back to that? I think if it's just an NAD deficiency, you're probably looking at seven, to, seven days to two weeks. If you're looking at a, a person that has a cardiomyopathy, you're probably looking at uh, three to six months. If you're looking with, at someone with POTS, it may well be even longer, POTS and, and um, antiphospholipid antibodies. So. So yeah, they're different, definitely different things that re react differently. Um, and you probably will need a different nicotinic acid um, dose as well. So I think it's, I think it's very virile. It's not just one little illness. It's a, it's a knock on effect and you kind of, kind of decide um, where you're going to bat, where you're going to be bat batting in the, just a energy deficiency or you're going to be going for a mitochondrial myopathy because that's sort of the spectrum that I, that I, I'm seeing in the patients that I deal with. Dr. Wenzel is a recovered long hauler himself. Uh, I asked him uh, if he could describe how it all came together for him. I'm not one of those guys that like to push something and uh, I'm not trying to sell a product. I'm trying to help out and trying to find what the solution is. And I think that's what the good thing about the, the group of myself and Guy and Robert. Robert's a real biohacker and um, Guy's a real intensivist and a pulmonologist and I'm an anesthesiologist. And the three, I look at risk. Guy looks at clinical and Rob looks at 
everything. And, and there's no rules here. We look everywhere. Wherever we can look, we're gonna, we, we, we hunt. And we, we have found papers where people are batting along certain lines. And it's, I'm, uh, I'm always, always have been very aware, you know, NEJM came out of the article that said that 70% of this rubbish stuff published was rubbish you know i think the animal study guys are a lot more honest because there's no glory in the animal study with mice or rats or ferrets or whatever so we've, we've gone back to a lot of animal studies and try to find the pathways and stuff like that i think we've probably read a thousand articles at least at, at least when it comes to nad and, and that allows us the patients ask me questions i go back i give them an answer and that allows me to find mo nearly all of the questions there's not many now that i i feel uncomfortable answering was there a, a light bulb moment for you when you it sort of clicked well I, th I think the light bulb moment was when someone suggested we write the first paper because we'd we'd been doing a lot of work together and and what once we'd kind of investigated that was the first light bulb the second light bulb moment i think was when we when i realized that that if you looked at the long COVID scenario and you went and go and look at NAD in relation to the, the symptomatology that you probably looked at a, a COVID-induced um, secondary pellagra as such. The symptomatology is exactly the same. Um, pellagra being a disease that is related to, to low niacin, um, it's subsequently been renamed um, to be an NAD deficiency disease. Um, if you look at that, then suddenly things start to fall into place. When you look at managing of pellagra, then you also suddenly realize that that's really the way that one should be going. I think the, the next was, why do people have the tachycardia? That was a, something that I I'd experienced myself and it wasn't related to the acute illness. It was related to months afterwards, after I'd been exercising very seriously. And when I realized that it's probably a nu nutritional deficiency cardiomyopathy that sets the people up after a, a strenuous exercise, that was also a light bulb moment. So, so they kind of continue as we as I'll, we look further and further into this thing. And um, subsequently, last week there were more light bulb moments. So the fact that the metabolic pathway from tryptophan to to nicotinic acid mononucleotide seems to be where where the money is at for us at the moment, and um, that ties in nicely with a lot of the other symptomatology. I think. We're very aware, uh, aware that this is a super complex type of a, um, of a disease process. There's straight viral related damage. Then there's a chemical component. And then there's a component that is damaged subsequent to the chemical um, deficiency. And if you kind of look at it in those kinds of three areas, then, then you start to sort of understand what the virus is really doing for us. I asked Dr. Vensel about his experience and why he thinks uh, some of us develop long COVID whilst others don't. The people that I see, and I was one of the same, I got over, it was a, for me, it was a minor infection initially. I was probably one of the first. I was in Milan at this time last year, probably to the day nearly. And, and my initial infection was mild. I'm fit, I'm young, I'm uh, active. Three or four months later, I still didn't feel 100%, but that's when I, I, I went and did a very heavy exercise. And that was the turning point where I got long COVID. Um, and it was quite aggressive. Um, so how do we equate? Why does a person that sailed through get this? And because in my, in my um, understanding is that because there's genetic modification and breakdown, continued breakdown of NAD, um, nicotinic acid isn't really readily available in the diet. I think um, exercise plays a big role in instituting the long COVID. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be extensive exercise. It just needs to be when your battery's flat, really. I've done some research, which has found a, a really quite statistically significant prevalence of uh, some pre-existing conditions amongst long haulers, specifically ATP um, and rheumatoid arthritis, um, which are seen many multiples of times higher, more frequently than we would expect. Does that make sense I to think, you? Absolutely. Uh, there's no debate about it in my mind. Um, I could probably list uh, 10 other things as well, which, you, which are, are basically we're thinking that when you look at that tryptophan to, to nectar, the gas mononucleotide, those metabolites are related to all of these um, all of these problems, in my opinion. 
I've, I've gone to look at lots. So, so I'm very convinced that, um, yes, they're all related um, and, and probably more than, more than um, what, what you're actually mentioning. I mean, there's been a few papers recently which have hinted there could be viral persistence. Um, where do you stand on that? Do you think it's likely or unlikely in long haulers? And how would that fit into uh, your hypothesis here about an ADD plus deficiency being part of the problem? Well, first of all, I think that the virus institutes some genetic changes. Um, just like if you had to give a patient a big dose of methylprednisolone, you know, the, the, the effect of the, of the changes for months to years afterwards. Um, just like that, I would say that COVID um, does exactly the same. It, there's a genetic change. Um, the debate about whether the viral virus persists as a viable virus for me is something that I would like to know. Um, I definitely think that there's genetic material that, um, that continues. And that basically goes back into the theory of how the search engines work and, and, and what do they actually do. The search engines are based on uh, are very dependent on NAD and zinc, and that allows us um, one of two of their big functions, which I think one should really take out of the way. The first function is is really to manage the the cytokine storm, if you want to use a, a layman's terms, and that it, that it does through its um, choking of the tumor necrosis factor converting enzyme. It basically slows it down and prevents interleukin one six and and tumor necrosis factor um, going out of control. The other thing the search engine does is directly attack um, viral virus at the time of infection. Um, so those are two things we do know. Um, being zinc and NAD dependent was, was quite an important thing because we know that some populations are, are NAD deficient, really the, the ones that, have, that are obese, type two diabetics, hypertensives, and there are many others that aren't really very well understood. Um, I think that is probably where of, of most importance, really. Because it seems that, you know, taking niacin, taking selenium, taking zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, quercetin, mm -hmm. this seems mm -hmm. to be a regimen that is positive. How, how quickly would you expect it to start to make a difference? How easy is it to replenish that, those low <laughs> NAD <laughs> stocks? Uh, you, you see me sigh like it because I've got, I've got patients all over the world. Um, I was in a long COVID group and I chose the worst patients that I could find, the most sick. That, uh, it's very variable. I think if it's just an NAD deficiency, then it's pretty quick. Uh, uh, I don't think that it, I think you've got to sustain the, the, the stack. Um, just talking about the stack because I think that's important. How did we choose what we wanted to do? Well, Zinc was a no-brainer because search engines need zinc. Um, and then we looked at um, NAD, what supplies NAD. Nicotinic acid was the one that, that was cheap and freely available in South Africa. And has turned out to be the one that we believe is going to be the, the, the one. As we've treated patients, it's become um, more and more so. Vitamin D, selenium, we've seen the studies and they say that those, those two work. Why did we choose Quistin? Because everyone uses quercetin well it wasn't very um popular back then but but why did we choose it right initially the quercetin basically helps those people that are obese so we're looking at decreasing the cd38 using utilizing quercetin so it's basically to decrease the breakdown of assist in decreasing the breakdown of nad um, we've had interesting results with the quercetin the other things that we think we're seeing but at this stage i think that um the stack is, is definitely the most important thing is the nicotinic acid. I think what we're doing there is we are, we are basically blocking the loading bay that, that prevents um, the sump from tryptophan to nicotinic acid mononucleotide. It's very, very clear. Once you've done that, it allows the body to re uh, replenish its tryptophan store. And, and, and tryptophan basically is used for serotonin. The serotonin is super important. If you go and look at the functionality of serotonin, it's just, uh, it's just uh, uh, really, really important. One final question, which is there seems to be a little bit of debate about actually dosage for nicotinic acid because of flushing and because some people have sensitivities to it. Is there anything you can say about that from your experience of treating your patients? <laughs> you can see my face is still red <laughs> this afternoon. It's, um, it's not a sexy molecule. Um, did we look at other things? Yes, we did. Um, have we had to go back to it? Absolutely, because we've actually tried a lot of varying things. 
Um, the flush is a problem. Uh, do we do we use the non-flushing type? No, we don't because there's also side effects. The dose it's been it's actually been used a lot in in various studies. The lipid study goes up to 44 milligrams per kilogram. So if you're 70 kilograms, it's roughly three grams a day, which is a massive dose. Um, we have had a lot of problems around the world. So, so if you're in the states, there's a lot of 500 milligram tablets, which I don't recommend. Even a thousand milligram tablets. Um, where do we where do we start? We start really small and conservative, eh? a little bit, 25 milligrams once a day, twice a day, four times a day, and then and slowly but surely. This isn't the body doesn't like metabolic change, rapid metabolic change. It likes to be slowly moved in the direction that you need. If you do rapid metabolic change, then you're in for a, a rough ride. Um, in the beginning, you you're quite arrogant and you go for it. Um, all hell for leather, but you pay the price in the end. So slow and easy is the way. Um, remembering that as an anesthesiologist, we always use the term, first do no harm. So, so that's really how, how we play the game. I look at long COVID as a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. And in the last few months, we've been finding pieces all over the place. NAD plus deficiency and MCAS look like they could almost be the corners of this puzzle. But then we've been finding all sorts of other rogue pieces that don't really seem to fit into the same picture. Like this, more evidence of autoantibodies. A great friend to the community, Professor Danny Altman, joining in here, saying, I consider this very likely, especially by analogy to Ebola and chikungunya, where autoimmunity does seem to be a big part of the answer. A big part of our lab direction of travel for the coming months is trying to relate long COVID symptoms to autoimmune profiles. And at least with the research establishment finally turning its eye of Sauron onto long COVID, as time goes on, we ought to be able to fill in the rest of this wretched puzzle. And my money is on it looking something like this. Till next time. <laughs>